President, thanks for being with us. We're here in the Citizens' Garden next to the European Parliament in Brussels. It's been six months since you took office, so it's time to take a look back. What would you say were the highlights of this first semester for you? Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, it is truly a beautiful place and a beautiful morning to be here in, uh, on, uh, in the Citizens' Garden. It's been, I'd say, a very challenging six months. Uh, I would start uh, with the sense of responsibility that uh, uh, I felt, uh, after having been passed on uh, such a great legacy by my dearly missed uh, predecessor, David Sassoli, uh, a few days after he passed, it was that sense that I said, I need to take his legacy and bring it forward and continue the great work he had done, already during a very difficult period during the pandemic, uh, and then looking forward to a high legislative heavy agenda with big laws that we need to debate and adopt uh, and push for the citizens. But what I didn't know at the time was that there would be war in Europe. Uh, so what uh, happened on the 24th of February with uh, Russia brutally invading uh, Ukraine, um, uh, leading up to the resilience and the strength that we have seen of Ukrainian citizens and the help that they needed from the rest of Europe in order to fight our fight in Europe uh, to uh, a decision that was taken, a momentous, historic, unprecedented decision that was taken to uh, admit uh, uh, Ukraine and Moldova's candidate countries to the European Union. I would say that those were the highlights, but also the moments when Europe and European Parliament was asked to deliver, uh, and I think we did. Yes, candidate country status is some, was something that the European Parliament was pushing for. And, uh, but we all know that there is still a long way for those countries to become members of the European Union. How can Parliament further help those countries in this road to the EU? Well, first of all, we uh, made it clear already on the 1st of March, and that means a few days after the Russian invasion into Ukraine, that we wanted Ukraine uh, to be a candidate country uh, to accede to the European Union. In other words, to, be, to come on the path with its European perspective. Why did we do that? Because for me and for this parliament, when countries and its people look at Europe as their home, then Europe should open the doors to them. Europe should not close the door. The pre-accession period, as we call it, from when you become declared a candidate country to membership is a part that requires a lot of work on both sides. In other words, there are laws to be brought in line, but there are also programs to exceed further integration. We look at where we are with trade, with digital, with education, research infrastructure, all of this while Ukraine is still fighting a war. It is a special situation, but one where the European Union has stepped up and definitely the European Parliament will continue to step up to play its part. And you just mentioned right now that Ukrainians are fighting our fight. What do you mean by that? You know, the European Union is not just an economically interdependent bloc. It's not just member states, countries that trade with each other, that do business, so to speak, with each other. It is a group of countries that believe in the same fundamentals. When we talk about justice, when we talk about freedom, when we talk about peace and democracy, these are not just buzzwords. We hold each other and ourselves to account, we also make sure that those fundamental values are defended across the world. And what we are seeing today is that Ukraine is fighting precisely for those fundamental values. I come from a country that joined the European Union in 2004. In 2024, it will be 20 years. It has been a transformational process. I know how important it is to young people in those countries to know that there is protection, there is security, there is an understanding that Europe is a project for peace. There's also an understanding that Europe is one that brings your quality of life higher, that your standards grow, that your, re your opportunities to study, to work, to live, also grow. I think that uh, is exactly what the Ukrainians are fighting for and that is what we should help them to fight for. And you think that they being part of the European Union will help them on that fight? Well, when I met President Zelensky on the 1st of April in Kiev, he told me 97% of Ukrainians would like to join the European Union. My answer was, we will be with you every step of the way. That is exactly what we need to do. It is up to us to make sure that that continues, that war fatigue doesn't set in, that we don't give the impression that one country, one autocrat can threaten the territorial sovereignty, the integrity of other countries on our continent. 
that is not acceptable. What is happening on our continent today are war crimes and we need to push back against it and fight against it. And that's what we will do. And we have seen in the latest Eurobarometer survey that most of Europeans support the European Union's response to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. We have also seen that the support for the European Union among Europeans is higher than ever. How do you interpret this increase on support in this precise moment? It is the support for the European Union, also the support for the European Parliament. And I would think that there has been a tectonic shift uh, in, uh, in Europe as to how citizens look to Europe and its institutions and its leaders to act. We saw it already during the pandemic uh, when the first instinct was to close borders. After that, we opened up. Why? Because we needed each other for medical equipment, for movement of, of medical professionals, and most importantly, for vaccines to be made available for all EU citizens. And then with the highest ever economic recovery package that is needed to still today for all those citizens and people living in Europe who need that help because of what they have suffered during the pandemic. What was the message from all that? Europe matters. Today, during war, Europe matters as well. And what we have seen across all parliaments in Europe, that citizens have asked their representatives to go further. So you think that the crisis, all of these latest crises, uh, have shown Europeans the benefits of being part of the EU? I think they have shown Europeans that if there was no Europe, then the situation would be worse. That Europe matters and Europe can be more. And this is why we are having the conversation. How can we go further? Let's look at the next few months. It's going to be very difficult. We are facing an impending food crisis. We are facing energy cuts. We are facing the, the, the understanding that we are not interdependent enough when it comes to energy sources. Some countries are further ahead on renewables than others. Some countries have had to fire up uh, coal plants that they have not had to do that for decades. So the decisions that we will take over the next six months will also require big responsibility, sometimes with difficulty at the European level, which need explanation, which need cushioning, because at the end of the day, we need to explain to our citizens why decisions are being taken. But once we do that, and once we understand that there is no other way to do this than together in Europe, then I think we can manage. It will be difficult, but we will have no other choice. We are seeing that some countries are already reopening some coal plants to make sure that they don't fall into shortage of energy in the coming winter. Um, what do you think about this decision? Was there any other option for them? This was already something that started to happen last autumn when the prices of gas and electricity started to go up. We were facing, in fact, quite a lot of misinformation campaigns already then, blaming the Green Deal climate legislation. At the end of the day, this was a, a market situation that drove the prices up. This is a concern that all governments and the European Parliament has. In some cases, because there have been gas cuts, because there are no alternatives, Unfortunately, coal plants have had to be fired up again. What has to be our ultimate um, goal? Zero dependence on Russia for gas, for oil and for coal. At the moment, we are still far away from that. That is why the sanctions packages were so important, the bans were so important. We need to go further, but at the same time, we also need to see where are we on investing in renewables? Where are we on making sure there are not so many energy islands in the EU, where countries have more supply, but they can't, they can't transfer it to anywhere else. At the end of the day, what we also need to say is where do we buy? And we're talking about common purchasing. We're, trying, we're talking about pooling of resources. Where do we buy or depend on our energy from? On our foes or on our friends? I think we need to cer certainly talk about um, an energy union that seriously addresses all the citizens in the EU. I also wanted to talk to you about the Conference on the Future of Europe. It's something that marked your first semester. European Union has brought together citizens from all countries, different profiles to discuss about the future and put forward their ideas to improve Europe. Uh, how important was this for democracy in Europe? I think one of the, the best moments over the past six months was the 9th of May, uh, Day of Europe in Strasbourg, uh, where uh, we go, uh, where's our seat uh, as a European Parliament, and we, we travel there for our plenary every month. On the 9th of May, thousands of young people were in that room and said the European Union needs to evolve, it needs to adapt, it needs to change, there are gaps that need to be filled, we want more. Uh, I was there together with the President of the European Commission and the President of France holding the rotating presidency and promised to return 
those demands with proper proposals on the table. This is the Parliament's position and this is the one that I will push for. And then you ask the European Commission to put forward proposals to respond to the recommendations that the citizens uh, put forward during the conference. Which kind of proposals do you want to see? Well, I'm definitely looking forward, first of all, to the State of the Union, but also to the decision by the European Council to trigger the convention that the European Parliament has asked for, a decision that has to be taken by simple majority. Uh, it is a, 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 a demand, a, a request that we will continue to push for. Uh, I think that we have seen that in health there is definitely more space for the European Union to act together. We have also seen now in energy that there is more space for the European Union to act together. There are discussions going on as to what kind of, of how decisions they are taken, with what kind of, 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 of voting procedure, for example. But I would also think that we need to have a conversation. So what do the citizens want from us? It's not high rhetoric, not big words, not numbers uh, in documents. They want us to deliver on real tangible deliverables. And I think that there, if we have seen what they want from us today, whether we act on migration, on energy, on health, on digital, I think there we can look at our infrastructure, our treaties, what can we change there? And let's have the conversation about that. And since we're talking about the way forward, um, in the next semester, what do you see as the most important topic? What should we keep an eye on? Well, first of all, uh, we need to continue to make sure and help Ukraine to win the war. Uh, that is our overarching goal. Peace in Europe. We cannot look away from that because that is precisely what Russia wants. From a legislative perspective, we have a huge work ahead of us. We have all the trialogues, in other words, the discussions that will take place and negotiations between the European Parliament and the Council on all the climate packages. We need to see where we are moving on migration package. We're going to focus now during the Czech presidency on resilience. We need to be prepared on how resilient we are for possible future pandemics. We need to make sure that we are better equipped from a digital point of view. We need to fight more against disinformation, misinformation. We are entering ultimately what is uh, the period that is preceding the campaign, right? All members of the European Parliament, 705 of them, are going to go back to their countries and say, we have delivered on this, we need to do more on this, believe in Europe and vote in the European Parliament. That will be leading up over the next couple of years and that is something that I have not only the privilege but a big responsibility to, 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 together with my colleagues in order to deliver on and that's going to dominate our work. That's a full agenda for next Quite semester. Full, but it's all right, I'm used to it. <laughs> but before that, we still have some weeks of summer to enjoy. What should we be reading during the summer? Oh, I like to read food books and oh, really? political biographies. So uh, I uh, just finished the second book by, by Ben Rhodes, uh, who was the, the spokesperson for, for Barack Obama. But I, I also have a, a penchant for, for Stanley Tucci, and I'm reading his book uh, uh, called Taste, um, uh, The Art of Good Food. I can't get the title now, and I, I absolutely love to do that. And I love to cook, so I will be spending a lot of time in the kitchen. That would be good. And do you have a soundtrack for that? Oh. A summer soundtrack? Mm, whatever comes up on any of my playlists, unless my kids are listening to my account at the same time and then I have to listen to their terrible taste in music, if I say that myself. Well, we'll conclude this interview here. Here from the Citizens' Garden next to the European Parliament in Brussels, I'm Marcia Bisotto and this is Roberta Mitzola, President of the European Parliament. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.